Okay, uh, so good evening, good morning, welcome everybody. This is a presentation from me, Clive Ellsworth. As I was just explaining, um, the result of a lot of emailing back and forth between myself and Stephen Stoft, who is the author of Carbonomics, uh, a book that was published about 10 years ago to great acclaim. Um, and he has recently um, put together uh, or had published um, a new book called Global Carbon Pricing with a number of other top economists. Uh, he's a top economist as well, uh, including Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Nobel Prize winning global, uh, Joseph Stiglitz and Jean Tirole and, and, and other top economists. So, okay, so let's get into this. Solving climate change. Get it. Um, my name is Clive Ellsworth. Um, I've got a, a, bit, a um, Bachelor of Science. I've got a degree in engineering um, long ago at Bristol, um, Bristol University in the UK, um, electrical and electronic engineering. So the topics, we're caught in a trap. Then um, I'm going to show you my visualization I put together. I became a programmer, so this is took a bit of software um, to show um, uh, um, economic blocks growing and emissions growing. Um, quick talk about what causes uh, decarbonisation. Really what the crux of the problem is the free rider problem and this is about solving the free, free rider problem. And how to turbocharge the Paris Agreement with that solution to the free rider problem. And uh, so there'll be questions at the end. I aim to make this about 40 minutes um, so that we can have some questions for Stephen at the end. Okay, so if that reminds you of the Elvis song, caught in a trap, can't get out, because I love you too much, baby. What is it we love? Uh, the fabulous lifestyle and money um, that, uh, that's available from cheap fossil fuels. So, and I've said rather more uh, prosaically, economies obviously in competition with each other thrive on cheap energy. We get national security, energy security, food, sec food security uh, from cheap fossil fuels. People who say, well, I mean, we're encouraged to reduce our carbon footprint, but when you see that a hundred and this, I got this from Brookings, 140 million people are lifted out of poverty every year. That's two Thailands every year. I was shocked. Uh, so becoming high energy using, high emissions citizens, and why shouldn't they? Why shouldn't they be like us? Why shouldn't they aspire to the same lifestyle that we have become accustomed to? Fossil fuels, yep. Yeah. Are you sharing something already? Or do uh, you think you are sharing something? Uh, thank you, Barbell. I thought I was, actually. Do you know what? I should run back. My apologies. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Hi, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Barbell. Uh, right. That was a mistake. <laughs> I practiced that and still forgot. Right, so share my screen. Uh, there we go. So let's just go go back so this is solving climate change these are the topics um and caught in a trap thank you for that um and uh, yeah in competition with each other thrive on cheap energy two thailands the world is awash so it's likely to stay to stay cheap for the foreseeable future the world is awash with shale gas I saw somewhere that I think Argentina may have even more shale gas than the US. Um, there's huge amounts of it around the coast of Africa, both west and east. There'll be a globalized gas market. It's on the way now. Um, gas will be cheap around the world by 2035. That's the projection. So, and emissions are projected to keep increasing. This is the BP Energy Outlook. Uh, here we are at 2015, and up to here is fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. And as you see, it just keeps increasing. And very good to see renewables expected to increase as well. Uh, I'm going to come back to this slide later on. It's going to pop up again. I'm going to use it for something else. Now, what's emerged from discussions with Stephen is he point, he's been pointing out 
that there's something strange going on with the way people are speaking, uh, prominent people such as Christine, Christine, Christiana Figueres, and even Michael Bloomberg. People are saying that, hey, self-interest is going to fix the climate. You know, renewables are so cheap now um, that, um, come on, you just need to follow your self-interest. But also, we must keep going back to the cops every couple of years to raise our ambition. Well, these statements are at odds with each other. If... If it's in your self-interest, then why do you need to raise ambition? There is billions and trillions of dollars floating about in capital markets looking for a good investment. That investment is going to, if it's in their self-interest, you don't have to have ambition. They're just going to do it anyway. So the, the thing that's rather dubious, uh, certainly Stephen has been telling me this, is that self-interest will fix the climate. Well, self-interest will go some way. Uh, but whether it will fix the whole climate problem uh, is rather more questionable. So how come people are in this state where they're saying statements at odds with each other? We suggest it's the result of everyone's failure to solve the free rider problem. You know, people are desperate, so they start to try and talk things up. Okay, so moving to the visualization just after this slide. Uh, so the thing to notice is partly I was inspired by that, you know, um, th that discussion. Uh, so wh what could I do to show an example of self-interest not fixing the climate problem? So and something that's been around for the last year in the newspapers, uh, you know, media in general, it's in our local self-interest to reduce pollution and that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as I said, Stephen's been saying that your local self-interest is less than the climate, in the global climate interest. Um, and that is borne out by this visualization coming very soon. Um, and just to say that it is actually assumes an optimistic scenario where strong carbon pricing will indeed, according to this visualization, you know, raise the self-interest. Now, if you have a strong carbon price, the stronger the carbon price is, the more it is in, in the interest of anyone uh, to invest in renewables. Once the price gets up to a certain point, then it also becomes worth investing in smart grids. Uh, so for, for reasons which are complex, uh, which, I, which I won't go into now, and then even storage, well, who knows whether storage will become anywhere close to being economic enough. Um, but people are hoping it, it is, it will be. Um, other people are looking at advanced nuclear. Um, some of which, some of the proposals are saying they're going to be amongst the cheapest, far cheaper than most fossil fuels. Um, but we have to wait at least until 2030 um, before they even start rolling out at all. Um, so we yes, it's expecting that Fossil fuels will indeed be priced out of the market eventually, and the emissions will be reined in this century. Right, so here it is. Um, now, is everyone seeing everyone else's pictures there? Because maybe I need to do this with it. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, so right now we're looking at uh, 1960. This is a picture of the world, uh, looking green in 1960 with the main economic blocks here. Here's my key or legend uh, that explains it. So each block is the population is the x-axis, it's going sideways. The per capita energy consumption is the, the height of each block. The city air quality is the sort of um, smoky bit in the middle. And the glow, the sort of beige glow, is a measure of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, these figures here update as we as I go through. Uh, so I, I did say on the slide some of the figures are sort of estimates. The world color is going to change. It's a rough indication of the temperature rise, stroke, you know, risk of irreversible climate change. So as we move along, we see um, North America, uh, Europe, and Japan being the main 
sort of emitters, I suppose Eurasia, that's um, you know, the Soviet Union, the Middle East growing, um, and you know, emissions increasing. But we're already seeing city air quality improving in these three economic blocks, North America, Europe, Europe and Japan, um, with um, you know, uh, vehicle um, regulations. And so it costs money. You have to be wealthy before you can afford to do things like that. And really, per capita, uh, per capita energy consumption relates pretty closely to per capita income. So let's go up to, up to 2015, pretty much where we are now. So China, we're seeing lots of em emissions. This is kind of going, the city air quality is now so, so clean in these places that it's kind of gone green. Africa is still pretty small, but it's growing. Uh, as we keep going, China is growing in wealth. Population has stopped growing, but we see enormous emissions, 2030, bigger and bigger. Um, now Africa, the population is absolutely exploding in Africa. If I go back to my, oops, back to, where was I? Um, maybe I can just type that in 2030. Yeah, um, back here. Yeah, Africa is yeah, nearly 2 billion. And we keep going. India's growing in um, uh, per capita energy, growing in wealth. And now everyone is becoming very green in their city air quality, but look at the color of the world in 2060. Um, PPMs, uh, atmospheric CO2, I mean, these are estimates, over 500. And if I, if I keep going, then everywhere gets nice, nice and clean air quality. Um, Africa's population, because they're, ex I mean, that population is expected to grow up to about 4 billion-ish by the end of the century, partly uh, in recognition that the wealth, you know, the per capita wealth and per capita energy is not expected to get to reach sort of Western standard levels, which everybody else is expected to, to reach. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, next. So, if that's shocking, uh, I'll go through this slide quickly. Many past civilizations collapsed. Uh, the Easter Islanders, the famous ones, many others. In, in their case, deforestation, soil erosion, whole cities deserted. I, I read that uh, in Europe about a thousand years ago, there was cannibalism. People have resource, had resource wars. The problem crept up on them. They knew it was happening. They must have, some of them must have known. They failed to take corrective action. As we know this time, it's global. But the frustration we all have today is that solutions are blocked by those who would lose. Uh, this is, you know, part of the, the <laughs> this is the worst side of it. The order of $30 trillion in fossil fuel assets are there to be protected. And we are bound up in this ourselves, many of us. If, if you've got a pension, it's quite likely that some of it's invested in fossil fuel assets. And yet again, we heard within the last week, in this case, a Canadian politician has lost his seat in a smear campaign. Some dirt's been dug up about him to get rid of him because he was campaigning for carbon pricing. Uh, do you know what? I think I might just leave that one. Well, uh, it, to me, it's as if, I'll just say this one. It's as, it's as if... We're acting like yeast in a bucket of sugary water. We're solving our environmental problems about as effectively. Um, so some kind of intelligent design is needed. So how about a new call, have fun creating a sustainable planet? Uh, and people say, come on, politicians, do something. Subsidize renewables. To me, that's like pushing, trying to push a length of rope up a hill. You've got to identify the head of the problem. Uh, it, it's also uh, not just mine, but other people's observation that people love to talk about what they know about. So I'll just say this. It was an, an old, an old timer at um, the Inland Revenue said to me, he, he'd noticed that 
the amount of time spent on talking about an, uh, an issue, even if it's an important issue, has not is not related to the level of importance of that of the issue, but how much they know about the subject. So he gave me an example. We went to a meeting long ago. There were two items on the agenda. Should they spend a million pounds on a new mainframe? And the other decision was, should they renew the contract with the company that cuts the grass outside the office? And they spent 55 minutes on one decision and five minutes on the other one. No prizes for guessing which was which. So Stephen set tells me he finds it very difficult to get people to listen and take an interest in the economics. I think you're, I'm speaking, talking to the converted here, but anyone watching this as a video afterwards, this is where the key solution, that this is where the key to the main solutions. Identify the head of the problem. To use my analogy, to continue my analogy, go uphill, pull on the other end of the rope. There you will find economics. If you're interested in solving climate change, economics suddenly becomes very interesting. The crux of the problem is the tragedy of the commons, which I'll say a little more about in uh, just in a moment the key is um these are the key to setting the right conditions for the very powerful market to solve climate change okay by investing in the right things so obviously it's a global problem i think people forget that sometimes atmosphere is our most globally shared resource so what when we say the tragedy of the commons what that means is that the problem is really the free rider problem. In a world this big with this many countries and people, uh, it's very easy for some countries to say, especially if they're developing countries, well, you know, let's let other people put all the effort in. Uh, it's uh, other people can do the work. We'll, we'll just free ride along and hope that somebody else solves the problem for us. But the mere thought of that of other people free riding kills the incentive for anybody to do it so that's why the effort is quite low at the moment we so we know we need to solve the free riding problem which means a global solution is needed international cooperation uh, now we this is what steven has been saying it, it that means a deal something that's an agreement you shake on you agree to it we will do We'll do it if you will, you will too. Okay, so this is what we're getting to, is what would that deal be? And why aren't we doing it? Brief slide here, again, for um, people who are not already sort of taken by the economics. I mean, we've been told this for years, change your light bulbs, avoid air travel. Is that going to be enough? Probably not almost certainly not. Uh, we heard a lot about energy efficiency, but efficient airliners now have mean cheaper air travel, there's increased journeys. This is called the Jevons principle, it goes back, that was identified a long time ago, many decades ago, it might be even 100 years ago. Um, now, I'm very, um, uh, 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 let's, let's say it like this, Bill Kip McKibben's campaign to divest from fossil fuels, to me, is laudable. He's very successfully getting lots of students to divest. But what I worry about, personally, I worry about, if you're going to transfer ownership of this huge, these huge, hugely valuable assets to people sort of closer to the sort of mafia type operation, then I don't think they're going to have many scruples about what dirt they dig up to, you know, get rid of politicians in, in further smear campaigns, you know. What are they going to do to get their money back? Cheap renewable energy, definitely sort of good, but what about this globalized gas market that's coming along? And what about all these other things, particularly aviation and shipping? You can't drive, can't power airplanes and ships with renewables, well, certainly not airplanes. So how to make it happen? Economists, this is what they say. If you want less of something, you've got to tax it. Now, I've made, just made a huge mistake there. I said the word tax. Uh, so I've put down here, tax is a four letter word in many places. It's not a tax if it's fully rebated. I felt I need to say that straight away. Um, 
if it's fully rebated, the government keeps no revenue. But the point of this slide is this thing here, the second point here. It means putting a price on CO2 emissions. Why do we want to put a price on CO2 emissions? Well, it creates a price differential. Uh, in other words, emitting greenhouse gases becomes more expensive. Everything else stays the same price. So what economists talk about is price signals. So a change in price, that's a price signal or wh whatever it is. It's like people notice, like, aha, what shall I do about that? You know what, that's, that's become more expensive, but that stayed the same price. Maybe I'll do that now. Or maybe I'll buy a, um, a hybrid car or something. So disincentivizes the burning of fossil fuels and incentivizes investment in all the things we want, low emission energy and agriculture, increased efficiency. And even with something more efficient, you know, it's still, it doesn't mean, oh, you know, well, it, it gets complex, but um, you, you get the increased efficiency without too much more usage. And it boosts all low emission green tech. So, and it works throughout entire economies. This is the, the power of carbon pricing. Those price signals percolate through, uh, throughout entire economies. Now, I said I'd bring this slide back. Here's an example of the price of something reducing the use. In fact, the pr price of fossil fuels reducing. The oil share dropped dramatically in the 70s because OPEC, I think they tripled the price first and then they doubled it again after that. So times six. If you look here in the 70s, in the 70s, there's a little dip, went up again, then it dropped. So actually, this is the main one here, isn't it? So oil, but we can see the gas as well. Well, actually, it's the share of energy for primary energy, oil really dropped there um, in the 70s. So, uh, again, economists say theory is great. What about practice? What about actual results? Um, there you see it actually, and you, can, you can see how much the price has to go up before usage goes down. So two main ways to price carbon. Um, there's cap and trade, direct carbon pricing. So these are both market, it could, we could call them market instruments, but with cap and trade, the governments cap the emission level. So they say, this is how much we're going to emit. It's gonna be capped at that. And the way that's gonna work is anybody who wants to emit you know, burn fossil fuels will have to buy a permit. Well, that's the theory. In practice, it's just been, well, it's operating in Europe. Uh, if I take the European example, it's been mostly for electricity uh, generation. A um, little bit of cement coming along, I believe. But so they're capping the emission level. If you cap the emission level and sell permits to emit, then the market will set the price because they'll decide how much they want to pay for these permits. So the EU ETS, um, European and many others spring up. Okay, so d direct carbon pricing is the other way of doing it. And really that's where the government say, right, this is going to be the carbon price. We are gonna set the carbon price. And then you'll have to pay that. And the market emits what it can afford. And examples of that, citizens climate lobby, carbon fee and dividend proposal, that's a policy proposal. Um, British Columbia, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a successful tax shift, which went up to $30 a ton. Um, and um, as you see, the UK with our carbon floor price. Now, like every other uh, sort of aspect of climate change, or almost anything, there's a holy war. Uh, carbon pricing has its very own holy war between cap and trade and direct carbon pricing. Uh, so the people who love cap and trade say, well, look, it gives him, it, it, it's, it's, it's giving us control of our emissions. We set the cap and we know what's going to be emitted. And it sounds, you know, all the trading side of it sounds like more market oriented, orientated. Um, and the banks love it. They can profit from the trading energy intensive industries, the generators, um, often get free permits. It's like being given money. It's fantastic. And politicians love to decide who wins and who loses, who's going to get the free permits. Direct carbon pricing, on the other hand, you can see which one I'm in favor of. First of all, the economists will say it's economically more efficient, provides a consistent downward pressure on emissions. So with cap and trade, if you have a recession, you've set a cap a certain level, well, you know, 
we're not emitting so much because nobody's really doing anything anymore. People can't afford to buy electricity. We're not making as much. We're not emitting as much. There's less need for permits. The price goes right down. Uh, whereas with direct carbon pricing, the pressure is consistently downward. Um, and investors prefer to have predictable price signals. They don't want um, you know, uh, big changes. What's the word? Uh, can't think of the word. But big changes up and down. Volatile price signal. Um, and when rebated, it reduces inequality. I mean, why aren't all the you know, socialist people absolutely clamoring for carbon, direct carbon pricing? And it's going to be political sustainable. If it, if it happens, politically sustainable at a much higher carbon price um, when, it, when it's rebated because the money just goes around and actually lower income groups benefit because they're lower fossil fuel users. Uh, but, oops, there's a catch. Either way, cap and trade or direct carbon pricing, national uh, carbon pricing contains a showstopper. It prices your country out of the global market and your manufacturing and jobs move abroad. This is really bad news. However, the playing field can be leveled, but, you, but only if we have international cooperation to, uh, to set uh, and harmonize the carbon price to set a common carbon price commitment. Uh, again, so as I say, it means a deal. And with a deal, it means we will if you will too. Right. Uh, okay, so you could say, uh, well, we're back to the future. 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we had the Kyoto Protocol. That was a deal. They had the right idea then, but it failed. Um, so I'm not going to read through this great big long list of key problems here, uh, but there were the problems were many and various uh, that all came back to the the fact that they were trying to agree a set of quantities, and they just could not agree on who should be capped by what. Um, there was no accepted principle for allocating the caps, uh, so um, negotiations became complex and. Uh, all, all kinds of fun and games. Um, so now, the COP process is still in operation. We've had, just had the Paris Accord, but a deal on a common carbon price has not been tried. Why not? Well, who knows? But anyway, we now have the Paris Accord, but the glo global carbon pricing group of economists are making the point that it's pretty much it's a statement of good intentions you know like your new year's resolutions uh there's no they're not binding um so they're called intended indc's uh intended nationally determined contributions right highly unlike highly likely to unravel um but the good thing about the paris accord is it allows climate clubs so you can have sm small groups of nations and we'll come back back to that idea in just a moment. So next thing is solving the free rider problem. This was something that excited me when I saw it. Again, it was in the uh, Global Carbon Pricing book. Now, let me show you this little bit of game theory where changing the rules changes the outcome. So um, what we have here, uh, Stephen actually said I should find some real results, but. I'm hoping that you're going to just see the principle of it here. I'm just going to show you the principle. So in this game, let's go, I'm going to play to see the game twice. One with this rule that everyone should invest the amount they pledged. And then we've, when we've looked at it that way. We're going to look at it where everyone invests their minimum pledge. Uh, so, and the way it works is everyone has $10 to invest and their money is going to be doubled by the banker by you know, the analogous to the global, global climate benefit. So remember that in game one, the rule is you invest the amount you pledge. So, um, and we have players from one to 10, um, altruists at this end, free riders here. I put in some numbers, you know, the altruist is gonna invest all their money, they put 10 pounds in, $10 in. 
and uh, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in with some suggestions, but if not, I'm going to, well, um, let's show, show you properly here. Yeah, so these are the pledges. Yeah, so 10, we can see what's being pledged. So let's leave those like that, right from 10 to one. So actually, um, what do we want to do? Just want to copy those and put them there. So they, they have to invest what they pledge. So they pledged this much. And when you add all that lot up, it adds up to $55. When it's doubled, banker doubles it to 110. So each player, divide by 10, each player gets $11. So after investing $10, player one has got nothing left, but they get their $11 winnings. And you can see that by the time you get down to the free rider player who only invested a dollar, well, they're looking significantly richer. So what actually happens in this case? Maybe some of you would have seen immediately that you don't want to be an altruist. You're going to lose out. Uh, in practice, what happens pretty much at the beginning, people soon work out what's going to happen and nobody really wants to pledge anything much at all. So the game doesn't produce much. Uh, and that's the free rider problem right there for you. Now, the... The, um, what this group of global carbon pricing economists are pains to point out is that you only have to change the rule, the rules, and it can completely change the outcome. So we've got a new rule here now where everyone in invests the minimum pledged. So if we do the same thing here, actually that was three just to make it exactly the same. You're going to see, I'm just going to, I'll do this to show you it working. So there it is. Uh, and and um, right. So what they're going to keep, but um, so no, they're not going to invest. That's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. The what they what are they going to invest from the minimum pledge? They're going to invest the minimum pledge. What's the minimum? It's one. They're just going to put one in. <laughs> so. Let's do it properly and show you properly. But maybe you can see straight away that if, if, if it's the minimum pledge that gets invested, people are going to say, hey, player 10, up your game, man. Put in at least two because you're the minimum. And pretty soon everybody sees, hang, hang on a minute, you cannot lose. Whatever you pledge, you cannot lose. So let's say everybody decides that, well, 10 might be a bit too much, so let's put nine in. What are they, uh, what, so they, they're gonna pledge, maybe, maybe one of them, maybe this guy still pledges 10, um, but they just pledge nine. In fact, maybe they, all, maybe they all pledge 10, apart from this guy here. He knows he can't lose. So the, the investment is nine. There we go, nine which means they actually get um, a much bigger payoff from the global climate benefit. I hope that makes sense from that rather rushed demo. Change the game, change the rules, and you change the outcome. Okay, right, let's whiz back. How to tur turbocharge the Paris Agreement. So a deal, that, what I've just been showing you there is a deal, if rules of the game deal has rules uh, okay you actually get a, an elevated self-interest in a deal if it's a good deal so you end up doing something you wouldn't have done if there hadn't been proper rules that you can have confidence in so that can apply to nations so it doesn't have to be just good intentions uh, okay so the their suggestion what they're urging is for nations to agree on a common carbon price, common co carbon price commitment. So it's not just saying this is going to be the price. It's a, a treaty. There's a bit more to it than that, but this is the, the, the basis of it. Countries can achieve that with, with, this is a very important point, because it steps aside from the holy war. They can achieve that with cap and trade, if that's their favorite way, if that's what they want to do, or direct carbon pricing, because 
both actually produce a national carbon price in that country. If they want to do it the cap and trade, fine. As long as they implement, as long as they achieve the carbon price that's been internationally agreed. And uh, rules can be designed to optimize the carbon price using the kind of mechanism I just showed you. Uh, and the optimum price is their local, local self-interest plus the global public interest. That's the optimum. Um, I'm going to say, put, mention Green Fund in a moment. Um, and of course, you don't have to have penalties for non-compliance, which provides confidence to bona fide participants. If you know that people not playing by the rules are going to receive a penalty of some kind, that makes it much, much less likely that they are going to break the rules. So what about non-participants? Okay, we hear a lot about border adjustments in citizen climate lobby, like tariffs, uh, which are duties levied on imports. Okay, and subsidies on exports, which are allowed by the World Trade Organization for environmental sustainability, provides incentive to join the club. So the argument for this, if you were a finance minister, what would you rather do? Watch your exporters pay duties to foreign nations because they're imposing a border adjustment on you? Or, you know, if you're in a place that doesn't uh, implement carbon pricing, or would you rather think about, mm, maybe we will actually have a carbon price. We'll, we'll collect those duties domestically and recycle them in our own economy. Maybe, maybe that would be a better choice. So that is the appeal of border adjustments. So there's the summary here. Uh, climate, climate club summary is rather than say to the COP, you know, we've got to get everybody to agree to this, is actually begin as a club of the main industrialized nations. Well, we can, we can hope, um, and who knows, we can campaign, make the case, that's what people like us do, for the US government, the Chinese government, and the, European, uh, the Europeans to join a club, to form a club, um, and form an agreement for, a, as I've been saying, a common carbon price. And take advice from the experts who've been working on this for many years, and trying to tell us about it for the last two years, treaty rules to maximize collect collective ambition. So there's uh, uh, an aspect called a green fund, um, which has been carefully worked out to incentivize developing nations to join, um, not be too hard on them, actually go a little bit easy on them in order to maximize the overall carbon price. And as I mentioned, penalties for club violators. Uh, penalty club, uh, penalties for club violators and border adjustments for non-members. That's it. Uh, the Global Carbon Pricing book, it's a free PDF, is available here, carbon.price, carbon-price.com. That's my own website there, climategamechangers.org. Uh, for those people that want a slightly easier read. Okay, I think that's it. I pretty much hit the, the right timeline there. Let's um, please unmute yourselves if you would like to ask a question. I'll unmute Stephen. Uh, I think what I do is stop sharing. Stop sharing. And don't stop recording. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, this is Greg. Uh, thank Hi. you. Hi, Greg. Welcome. Uh, thank you for the overview. I'm certainly no economist, uh, but uh, it sounds good to me. One question I had, yeah. you mentioned that the banker was going to double the payout. How does that work? Well, that's a little example um, on on Excel to show the principle uh, of a of a you know a made up game. So that's just that's showing the principle. So it, it, so maybe what you're asking is um, in terms of of investing in renewables. You know, how does that pay back? Well, the payback in that case is you know we don't 
we don't have climate catastrophe down the line. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that it's not necessary? I mean, to actually have a dollar payback here. I mean, yeah, it's it's talking about a a benefit from right. an, from an investment, and that's taking a very simple example of making a, a, a monetary gain, a game, where there is a gain. Mm -hmm. um, for, you, know, you win the game and you get some money back at the end of it. So it's 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 taking the the theory and making it as simple as possible, mm -hmm. so that you can see that changing the rules can change the outcome. Mm -hmm. Of course, investing in renewables <clears throat> or you know reducing, however it is we reduce emissions, takes investment, and the benefit comes much later down the line. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe so I could say a word. Yes, please. <clears throat> The, the doubling is meant to represent purely the climate advantage. Currently, what we believe is that if we spend $100 trying to improve the climate, we will get more than $100 benefit from the climate, perhaps even 10 times the 100 that we spend now. Once we get near spending enough, then the payback won't be bigger than what we spend in the stock But right now... Sorry, Stephen, you're a bit uh, muffled then. Do you mind just saying that again? Um, okay. No, just, that, just that last the last few seconds, it went a bit muffled. Okay. So, currently, if we spend $100 on the climate, the benefit from the climate is much greater than $100. So it's not cash back, it's climate benefit coming back. So we model it in the game as dollars so that people can play the game. So, so that people can... Play the game. Play the game, right, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense, uh, Greg? <laughs> Well, that's the other issue of, of discounting. Yes, there'll be climate benefits, but maybe not to me, it'll be future generations. So is there a discounting issue here? Uh, would you like to answer that, Stephen? Well, yes, there is. And if you believe the discounting is very serious, um, which some people do, then it could be that spending $100 now only gets us $50 of benefit, in which case we shouldn't do anything because it's really a waste of money. So it just depends what you believe about um, climate change and the benefit of taking action. If you, if you think it's worthwhile to spend money on it, then you're getting back more than you spend. If you don't think we should be worried about this problem, and we believe that we're getting back less, including discounting, than what we would spend if we tried to fix it. Thanks, Stephen. Anyone else? Hi. Hi, Paul. Um, I, was, I was just wondering um, about the, the practicalities of getting these industrialized nations to work together and where we do have a common carbon price more or less is in Europe mm. um, so would would perhaps an initial thing to campaign for be for Europe to put on border adjustments to protect its economy not doing tariffs in America so wouldn't it be a, perhaps a good Thing to come home for and maybe a, a more realistic than getting. I mean, we're not going to get the US on board at the moment, I don't think. Um, no, I have my own thoughts about that, um, but I'd be interested to know what Stephen thinks. I think I'll let you handle this one. Thank okay, you so much. all right, well. Uh, uh, I'm sure we've discussed this, Paul, but, I, but I'll, I'll say that um, I mean the Europeans. Was it two years ago? We put um, a, a sort of a tariff, a charge on air air travel, didn't we? And uh, that caused a lot of quite a lot of upset. So I I think um, you know I I join. I think uh, this is partly part of what's. James is proposing actually, and he's well. He's proposing 
border adjustments between, uh, I'll let you say more about that if you want to, James, uh, European countries. Um, but it'd be, uh, I'm not sure if you're also proposing uh, the, the border adjustment between you know Europe and everybody else. It would make sense to me. Uh, I'd happily put my name behind it and my efforts behind it. Uh, whether it's the easiest thing to do or not, I, I don't know. Uh, the impression I get is that border adjustments, they kind of sour relations, international relations and trading relationships. Um, well, as, as we're seeing now, with, with, right now with US and China. Um, and it's kind of rather more polite and nicer if you can all get together and say, look, in the case of carbon price, you know, there's, there shouldn't be a need, ideally, to have border adjustments between each other. If, if everybody wants to... Is, what you know is going to play the game and in paris they all said yes we're all on for this then why not get together and say well you know we'll have a common carbon price that will be that ensures there will be a level playing field um maybe what you're suggesting paul will be a good place to start and say well if you're not going to do that then <laughs> it'll have to be border adjustments mm. uh, or, or but, us and so. china I mean, us and china carbon price now i think so. Yeah, um, I, 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 I don't. Um, it sounds perfectly good idea. I think it a lot depends on you. Know, who do you know? Do you know negotiators in China? Do you know Chinese people? That, that uh, how would we get this going? What's the easiest thing to do? So I don't really have a strong opinion. Um, I'd listen to uh, actually other people's suggestions. How about you, James? I wonder if he's there, actually. I'm just oh, wondering yeah. if, if Stephen has something to suggest on Europe, because Europe is, a, is just a slightly more complex version of, of what you've been talking about generally. Well, well Stephen seemed to decline just now, uh, uh, James, because I think he's more expert on America. Are you sure there's nothing else you want, want to add to what I said, um, Stephen? Um, could, could you just clarify the question about what you're asking about Europe is that the internal or the external negotiation? I think it's really starting with the external, an external border adjustment between Europe and everybody else. Um, uh, I can't hear you, uh, uh, Stephen. Oh, You've gone mute. There okay. we go. I hit the mute button wrong. Right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just a diplomatic question about what the reaction will be. It would certainly be best if you could get the US, China, and Europe together and then put on the, the border adjustments. I think they would be strong enough together to make it work. Um, mm. But if it's, if it's Europe against the US, um, I don't know. It's. I, I, I think what Clive said is probably right, that it's diplomatically to apply, but who knows? Mm. Oh, yeah. um, I asked that, that question of a banking lawyer, I actually asked him about what if Britain put a border adjustment against everybody else, and he just said, he said, you've got to have clout, essentially, and the rest of, them, the, rest of the world will just laugh, um, because Britain has nothing like enough clout uh, to impose a border adjustment on everybody else. So yeah, uh, Europe, US, and and Japan and uh, China. Uh, that's a lot of clout. <laughs> Anyone else? Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Ah, is that uh, Anders? Yes, I'm. My my connection is. I was in a meeting, ending at a little bit past eight, and then I. It's okay, so, Anders. Far away. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I think that. Uh, Border adjustments are not that unpopular and, and we should not be too defensive about that, especially when it comes to, to Europe. Europe is clearly big enough. I mean, there's, there's a myth going around among economists that there's, that there's no tariffs and small nations cannot impose them. But I bet Norway has sky high um, tariffs on cheese. Mm -hmm. And we are a little bit sort of uh, worried about tariffs uh, imposed by the EU uh, on our salmon and fish. But mm. all of this is regulated and it, it's sort of business as usual among sort of nations because you need to protect and everybody realizes that we should 
in general have uh, lower tariffs, but but tariffs have been there all the time and will come. And with the with sort of the importance of, of the the climate issue, mm. uh, uh, public opinion will not be any more shy uh, on backing uh, t border tax adjustments than other things. I mean, if if Trump has, if, if it was politically uh, possible for Trump. If it was not a climate denialist, he, of course, to hurt China, could uh, just uh, have border tax adjustments. What he is doing is actually something of the same kind. And, and mm. you know, China has, uh, on its own part, due to what is happening in the EU, where it's most probable that, that you will get the, uh, a high, a so high carbon price that border tax adjustments will come on the agenda. It, it is not there yet. Uh, but China is now preparing this national Euro emission trading system just to say when EU imposes border uh, tax adjustments that they have a, uh, a carbon tax internally. So, I mean, this is not so far away. What is really lacking is, of course, popular mob uh, mobilization behind a, a carbon tax itself. That, that's the key. <clears throat> okay. So, so. Well, I tend to agree with, with Anders in, in that um border adjustments um oh, i don't know whether or not they're they're seen as acceptable but i my view is i see border adjustments as an essential way of protecting clubs of countries if as you suggest clubs of countries is the right way to go um in terms of the european question that that Paul was asking one of the challenges in European legislation is it requires a unanimous decision to impose uh, the type of carbon tax that we're talking about and the establishment of the original uh, ETS system. So to change that uh, includes dealing with some countries that are clearly uh, anti-changing that because it's not in their interest because they are heavy polluters. Hmm. So the approach I've been looking at is a way of um, a combination of setting an EU border tax so that EU effectively starts to protect its total industry from leakage and its total economy um, as it pushes for more environmental responsibility. Uh, and then within the EU, it comes up with some variation on the border adjustment, which clearly wouldn't be borders because we're not allowed to have internal borders, but achieves the same end economic goal of protecting countries inside the ambitious club with a common higher price than the current ETS. Hmm. And is that with things like different differing sales taxes? Um, the approach is modelled on, on what I've seen from a number of economists about focusing on a small number of industry sectors with what they classify as energy intensive goods, which is a relatively small proportion of the total um, economic um, trade globally. Consequently, you're dealing with a, a relatively small number of transfers. And if you then deal with those goods rather than as a border adjustment, but as, as intrinsically polluting goods, so what you're trying to do is track harmful uh, emissions uh, embedded in products and how they're created, then you can effectively apply a border adjustment in the tracking and transaction and, and the transactions associated with those goods within Europe. But you'd have to deal with it differently. And that requires political will to do that. Mm. But the reason I think we may be at an opportune time to look for that sort of answer is Europe is effectively tied to the ETS in terms of strategy and politically, and because a number of countries will not vote against it because they don't want it replacing with something more effective, mm. their high pollution. But what we are seeing from countries like France and other countries that have substantially decarbonized is it's in their economic interests to create a club that has a border adjustment. So as, as Anders was saying on our call the other week, it's, it's fairly obvious that a lot of why Macron wants France to have a border adjustment for Europe 
uh, and a higher carbon price is it benefits the French economy. Our assessment of the Portuguese economy is very similar. It's substantially decarbonized with renewables. Um, mm. Portugal has almost zero influence on EU policies. There's a real frustration. But the idea of a club that could do that, I find quite interesting. And that's the sort of approach I'd be interested in in other people's opinion. Mm. I'd like to yeah. add a couple things. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think there's two discussions here that need to be distinguished. One is whether the border adjustment tax is to protect your own carbon intensive industry or whether it's to stimulate a global climate policy. And if it's just to protect your own industries, then fine. Go ahead. Uh, great idea. Lord House, who's the one that's really worked on this, says it's completely inadequate. Sorry, who's worked on this? I missed what you said. That's, that's uh, William Nord, Nordhouse. No, Nordhouse, thank you. Yep. Um, what, he, what he says is that a, a border adjustment tax that only taxes the carbon content of imports is just way too small to do any good on a global scale in order in other words to enforce any kind of global agreement so he proposes a much much stronger tariff applied to everything and he shows how high it has to be in order to get the world to cooperate so that's quite an interesting paper it's in our book our book is free so uh, that, that sounds really interesting because um, actually the approach I've taken to date is based just on CCL's carbon fee and dividend policy and the border adjustment from the discussions with industry is about protecting elements of the economy and what you're talking about if I've understood you correctly is the type of game element to change to really create a, a um, almost a moral difference in countries that show ambition and those that don't, and so we're going to tax everything at a much higher level. Is that correct? I, th I think it, it is. I'm talking about giving an incentive for a global agreement to keep one enforced. I don't think you can start with that, but I think you need to go there after you get started. But I find that quite compelling, and, and at the moment, our, the, the approach I've taken is based purely, purely on what, what I understand to be uh, legal under the World Trade Organization. Yeah, you're correct on that. It's, it's, uh, Nordhaus admits what he wants to do is not legal. Okay, <laughs> but I'm quite comfortable that we talk about things that are not legal, because the things we're considering in Europe are currently classed as not legal. Now they can't have borders between uh, members of the European Union. And, and part yeah, there's of one, more, one more point that might help you. Sorry? Uh, one, more point. one more point I'd like to make that might help yeah. you, which is that our idea of carbon pricing was set up so that Europe was specifically designed so that Europe could um, keep its ETS and comply with the carbon price. So mm. Europe would not have to throw out the ETS, it would not have to move away from cap and trade. It would just have to adjust the ETS so it hit the right price on average. It could be off a little, but maybe you know, but that, that's the same approach I, I've taken in the model I, I've worked on, which assumes a carbon price is almost certainly higher than the existing ETS, and almost the ETS becomes irrelevant in the countries that commit to a higher carbon price over time. Um, and what, Great. Is that consistent with what you're describing, Stephen? It, it's almost consistent, except we would require Europe to meet the global carbon price, either with more restricted ETS or with add-on taxes to complement the ETS. Okay, so, so this is one of the subtleties in, in the approach I've taken so far, which may not be correct. 
which is to assume that Europe will not be able to vote for a high end carbon price unanimously. So I'm trying to find a way forward for the more ambitious economies of Europe, generally the more developed ones, to move on a higher carbon price and leave the rump of countries that are high polluting with the ETS at a lower carbon price and effectively operate something close to a dual border. But I can see that already that that would limit the possibility of achieving the higher tariffs you're talking about proposed by Nordhaus. Um, well, the tariffs are a little separate from the carbon price that you would achieve. Uh, it would be okay in our system for Europe on average to achieve the carbon price. It wouldn't be necessary for every country to achieve it. Okay. I'd be very interested in, in more information on that if, or, or point me at exactly the work that describes that. That's very relevant to what I'm looking at at the moment. I'd be really interested. Chapter four. Sorry? Chapter four. Chapter four. Thank you. <laughs> hmm. Very good. Um, Anyone else? I'm sorry just... for being late, but I, I think it's, uh, <laughs> there's a, the point here is that I'm more optimistic of getting a sort of a European wide uh, increase in the uh, carbon price, partially due to what is happening in the ETS, as uh, uh, James mentioned about Macron uh, from pure self interest. But I think what Macron will do is to pressure uh, the other EU uh, countries into a bit more ambition and that will have support from the climate movement and that uh, is sort of my key point uh, just now that the, the the key here is to get the climate movement in europe to demand this uh, and internationally i think it, 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 as i said in previous meet, meetings that it's it's the weakness of the climate movement which is the problem the climate movement has never ask for a sort of a effort oriented uh, 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 agreement. So they are completely stuck with this cap and trade uh, common but differentiated uh, responsibilities, which will lead nowhere as it's pointed out by uh, a lot of people. So the, the key uh, is to get, uh, for example, Friends of the Earth International uh, attack Greenpeace, uh, 350.org, at the next next uh, uh, COP meeting, to demand two things: first of all, that sort of every country, as a part of the um, uh, contributions, have either sort of a drop in subsidies or sort of even a symbolic tax of one dollar per ton in every country in the world would help. And then, of course, that will raise the question of, of the distribution of tax revenue. I will leave that. Everybody, all of us agree that that should be sort of uh, CFD-like. But mm. uh, secondly, uh, you have sort of to get sort of the tax ID into the agenda. It is the taxing of international transport and the, uh, and the distribution of the funds from that, which will be absolutely enormous uh, due to the, since uh, international transport, especially uh, shipping, is uh, bigger than Germany when it comes to emissions. Mm. And, you know, the International Maritime Organization last week sort of now sort of in principle agreed that, that uh, international transport uh, should be, uh, be taxed. So I, I think to be a little, little bit uh, rough and critical, to make too much game theory without thinking about sort of what are the actual political forces on the ground that could uh, sort of focus and concentrate the political pressure. That's the climate movement. And secondly, to make sort of easier demands, which are not sort of, let's assume you have a banker and let's uh, that we, we double the, the, the sort of the, the, the chips that we put in and get repaid and so on. That, that's good to, 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 to show sort of the logic of the thing. But I mean, mm. you must uh, certainly not lose sight of the fact that let's, if there had been allowed demonstrations in, in Paris in December 2015, what would have been the, the, the demands from the climate movement? And the, the, the regrettable answer is nothing. And that's our mm. real problem. Mm. That, that's like really our, that, that uh, Friends of the Earth, the uh, UK, okay, Norway, we have some good uh, um, things, uh, which was uh, good policy voted up on the Congress, but uh, unfortunately, 
We will see in, at the next Congress uh, the, this next week. The leadership is not backing those good demands a little bit, but not far too weak. But if other countries, UK, Germany, Bund in Germany, could follow that up on this sort of very simple uh, couple of demands in the co process, that's the way to go. Well, let's put something together at our next Monday call. Um, uh, and and as uh, Friends of the Earth is just around the corner from me here. I can, uh, and they've been quite helpful actually. They've given us meeting space and stuff, so I'm sure I can go and talk to talk to one of them, one or two of them, uh, and just see what was just we can try. You know, we can see if they're receptive. Anders, I just want to say I'm completely in favour of your approach if it's a pos if it's possible because it's it obviously achieves more my concern is i'd rather have an approach that caters for the possibility that there is resistance for, from some countries and that there is a way of penalizing or separating them so that the ambitious countries can move forward and don't get held back but i, I don't james i don't think we have this is purely a tactical discussion because you will attack here from 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 several angles and with yeah. several movements and, and so the, the one attack will support the other but if you don't get popular support uh, for sort of the, the the tax idea then then sort of all no nice game theory uh, will will work because um, Clive was talking about sort of then you have to give sort of the the, the, the non-complying uh, uh, nation some penalty but the only mm real penalty which exists in this world is that sort of public opinion is uh, against you and they will vote for someone else. I mean, so it's in a way it's, it's, uh, it will be extremely important what, what Corbyn does in, in these uh, cases. Will he, what will he do when it comes to climate policy? That's not quite clear to me. I'm trying to follow it, but it, it seems to me that he's not, or sort of the, the, the momentum group has not decided yet. And so Corbyn has not come forward with any, any climate policy besides sort of the general um, talk about the urgency and the need to do something. But what is actually going to do? And of course, if he sort of backs Macron for, for better reasons, for a sort of a socially just carbon price, that will... Uh, of course, change the whole game because I mean, the whole left and climate movement and all sort of uh, progressive forces in Europe is looking towards Corbyn because he's the really only alternative to, to, the, to the current policy. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, th thanks, Anders. Um, if there's no more quick questions, I think I should press the stop button on this now. Um, we can always carry on talking, but I think we'll keep going in this vein um, next Monday anyway. Uh, any other quick questions? No, no question, but I have to go now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I saw your message there. Thank you, yeah. Babel. Th thanks for the presentation. Oh. Food for thought. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you enjoyed it. Okay. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye -bye. Is, Bye. Any, any other questions from anyone? Um, I'll, if not, then we'll close and I'll just say thank you very much everyone for attending uh, and particularly thank you to Stephen for being with us to answer questions. Thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, mm. yes. see you. See you next time, folks. Thank you. Thanks for joining, Greg. Uh, thanks a lot, Clive. Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Clive. Welcome, James. Thanks for being there.